with, we'll try not to go as fast as our song player there. And <laughs> slow down just a little bit. Another glorious day the Lord has allowed and granted by his grace and by his mercy. Please be mindful of those that are on our prayer list and keep them in your prayers. Uh, we know that Stan is still in the hospital, Stanley Pawinski, really in dire need of, of prayer, and I'll just leave it at that. God knows, so we need to keep him in prayer, um, as well as everyone else on our prayer list. Deborah Swartley is ailing in her body, and her husband is away, so we need to keep her in prayer as well, as, as well as everyone else on our prayer list. Today, as the Lord allows, we're back in our study, and we're going to, by way of review, start in chapter 2 and begin our reading at verse 7. Chapter 2 of verse 7 of 1 John, as we continue in this great book and allow the Lord to continue to touch us and bless us and minister to us. And we read, if you're there, please say amen. And we see in verse 7, and, and uh, John had been ministering to us and blessing us with some truths in regard to his time, uh, again, him being the last apostolic authority, and he's giving instructions to the churches there in Asia Minor in Ephesus area. And, and he says in verse 7, he says, I, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, he says, which ye have heard from the beginning. And, and guys, we see this commandment. He doesn't actually talk about it or list it. But we did go into Matthew and we saw God's commandment of love that we are to love our God with everything that we have and that our love for him goes above everything else. And even the second is likened unto as we love our neighbors as ourselves. But what we see is from the old covenant, it was a God that was out there a bit, but with Christ in our heart through his, his Holy Spirit, it's been kicked up a notch. He goes on in verse 8, he says, again, a new commandment, and again, not a contradiction, just showing us how it's been kicked up. He says, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him, and he's talking about being true in Christ and in you. And I love the verbiage here, he's saying that it's true in Christ, of course it is, and God's spirit being inside of us, so it's true in us as well. It says, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shining. And look, it shining surely on this world when Christ came and did what he did in regard to his death, burial, and resurrection and shines now in our hearts as we have received him as our Lord and as our Savior. In verse 9 he writes, And he that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even now. And, and, and John helps us understand, guys, that regardless of how it used to be, those old thoughts, those old uh, uh, things, that prejudices that we once had, that in Christ, all that's ta been taken away. And, and look, if we go there, we say we're still hating it. There's an issue with the relationship we say we have. Again, verse 9, he that said, that saith he's in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. And guys, our love for one another shows the world who is really in our heart. And it's not Satan, it's not the world system, but it's Christ that lives inside of us. And because, look, Christ loved the unlovely, and by the way, that was all of us. Now, we can love those that might not appear to, to actually earn our love, but guess what? We didn't earn his, so we give it anyway because we have been freely been loved by Christ, and we give it out the same way he gave it to us. And verse 11 says, But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness had blinded, it says, his eyes. And, and listen, there are some false believers out there, in fact, many false believers, and we'll see that throughout this sermon, that they can't really see clearly. We are talking before about those that are protesting because we're trying, because we're supporting Israel. And, and those are protesting. They can't see beyond what their hearts and their flesh are telling them, mainly because they don't have God's spirit in them. And, and they can only see from their vantage point. But, but God said that in regard to us, that look, our eyes are darkened. We're not to go to that zone anymore. We're able now to do righteous things only because of the righteous one 
who lives inside our heart. Guys, please be prayerful with me as I preach around this subject or this series. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And Father, as we dive deeper into this epistle, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you'll touch and bless each and every one within the sound of my voice. And Father God, that even though you kept us last night and you woke us up this morning and you even sent us out here to this service, Father, we didn't really know what to expect, but we know that we were to expect truth in regard to our worship service, Father God, because we know you only minister to your people in spirit and in truth. I ask that you would hide your preacher, your teacher of the hour behind the cross of Christ. And Father God, that you'll bless me to say what you've had me to learn throughout this week. And Father God, allow it not to be my words, but to be your words of truth inhabited by your spirit. And bless our hearts as you place it in the place where it would do the most good. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We say yes to your will and to your way as we pray in Jesus' name and for his name's sake. And let God's church say, amen. amen. And amen. Continuing on in chapter 2, and we'll pick it up at verse 12. And here we see as John writes, he says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you. It says, for his name's sake. And I love the fact that he's talking about not his little children. He's talking about God's little children. He's talking about those that have been saved by God. And what he's saying is that he's actually talking about all believers here. When he makes that statement, he's saying that all who have been saved are little children and they belong to the Lord. But he goes on and he begins to speak about different and various believers in the next verse. And, and he's speaking about to these believers in regard to where they are spiritually. And listen, some of us are, are, are strong in the Lord. Some of us are, are babes in the Lord. Some of, some of us are, are, are just getting there in the Lord. And, and he's speaking about this. And, and he starts showing us the different degrees of maturity of the believers. He says, I'm going to read verse 13 again. He says, I write, I'm sorry, I'm read verse 13. He says, I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. And listen, he says fathers in that category would be the most mature. Those who have been in Christ for a while, he's been blessing them. They've been reading his word. They've been understanding his truth. And, and they've been growing in grace. And look, they have not let any dust uh, 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 track them down on their feet. They've been moving along in Christ. What they don't understand, they dig into his word and understand. And, and look, time and hallelujah, opportunity and God's spirit has matured them to know some things that other weak Christians does not know. And he says here that he has written to, he has written to them that uh, has known him from the beginning. In other words, the beginning from the, when he blessed them with salvation and they hadn't stopped there, they continue to grow. He continues his verse. He says, I write unto you, young man, because you have overcome the wicked, the wicked one. And, and listen, another category, look, it would be mid-grade or mid-level. They're not as mature as fathers but they're in Christ and, and they're learning and they're digging and they're trying to learn more and more about him. So much so they already know that there's an enemy of this world, there's a God of this world, and they've overcome him. So they're not stumbling a whole lot because they're still growing in grace and learning more and more about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and learning less and less about themselves. And they're majoring on the major who is Jesus and minoring on the minor who's themselves. And they're beginning to grow and get to that place that God would have them to be. He says in verse 13, I write unto you fathers, because you have known him from the beginning. I write unto you young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. And he says, I write unto you little children, because you have known the father. And, and again, he mentions here little children in verse and before we go to verse 14, he's talking about those new newfound babes, those who have just come to faith in Christ. And listen, they had not realized or, 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 or come to a place of, of, of understanding him thoroughly or what as, as much as they will as the young men or the fathers. But they are saved and they're in Christ, but they're still babes in Christ. And guys, there's nothing wrong with that. 
And in fact, I love that. The fact that somebody has come to faith in Christ, that's a good thing. Unless you've been in Christ for years and years and years and still had this designation of a babe, that, that you're still on pablum, that you're still on the bottle, that you're not growing at all. All you know is you go to church, you say amen, you go home, you put your Bible in a corner, and, and listen, you wait until the next week and you break it out, blow the dust off of it, and bring it back into church again. And, and listen, for a babe, one who has just been born is expected. But for someone who has said that they've been in Christ for years and years and years and still don't know the base things of being delivered from different various things, there's a problem. <clears throat> and the problem is not with your relationship. Well, the problem is not with Christ. The problem is with you. I, I recall my son when he was a little guy, and we talked about a long time ago. And he used to had this thing with a bottle. He had a relationship with his bottle. And, and he would have that thing in his mouth. Now he's a toddler and, and ought to be growing out of this thing. And, and, and I don't know how he would do it, but he would jump and run and play and somehow he would keep that nipple in his mouth and, and, and the little teeth would hold it. He would swing it around. It would never fall out. And he didn't want to turn that thing loose. And my wife was sharing with me how he would, he would, he had a little high chair. He would walk, push the high chair over to the count, count, uh, countertop, climb up the high chair, get the juice out of the cabinet or the refrigerator, pour the juice in the bottle, put the top back on, and suck that juice out of the bottle because he was hooked to it and didn't want to come out of it. And for years, well, I'm not, I don't know how long he was, but for a long time he was. And, and eventually, and I believe I got this right, my wife told me she finally just took and hit it. And that broke him out of the cycle of looking for that bottle all the time, guys. And I dare say, even with the Lord, that there are times that, that, that folk who have been in Christ a while and, and they won't realize who he is, they won't grow, they won't mature, that he's going to do uh, different various things to get them in his word and to get them to realize they can't do life without him. And those old things, those baby things, they need to put down and they need to begin to grow up in Christ and realize that, listen, with him we can do all things, but without him we can do nothing. He says in verse 13, I, I, I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that was from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you know the father. He goes on in verse 14. He's actually just simply telling us there's reason for writing. Uh, for writing. He says in verse 14, I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. And, and listen, he's saying I'm writing to you because you know him, you're maturing him, and that's why I'm writing to you. He says I have written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. And listen, what John is saying to, to these categories of folk, and, and take note, he didn't make, actually mention the babe, but he's saying to this category of folk, he's saying, keep up the good work. You're on the right track. Don't stop. Don't stop growing. Keep looking and studying and understanding God's word. And don't study just to make your head big. Study so that you can take that truth and place it in your heart where it will do the most good and where you can actually grow and be a blessing to someone else along the way. He goes on in verse 15. He says, love not the world neither the things that are in the world. He says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And guys, what we know is that Satan, under God's permission, is in charge of this world system. And look, there are some times when, when, when even believers, man, well, we get hung up on the things of this world and like this is my house or, or this is my car or this is my dog or, or, or this is my, my friend and, and I'm not giving it up. And God said, we already saw it last week, that we're to love nothing more than we love him. He says it. And when he says it, he means it. And we need to go ahead and be obedient to what he's saying. He said, love not the world, neither the things of the world. Look, I've I got some things that I like. 
But what I know is that, look, if he decides to come whenever he decides to come, I'm going to turn them things loose so fast, it's going to make your head spin, and we ought to all be at that place. I appreciate God giving them to me, lending them to me, and he's put them in, in, in my, my, my possession to take care of them, but I know I'm not taking nothing with me. I can't love them, no, nothing that way. And listen, even my wife, I love her dearly, really do. But what I know is, if for whatever reason she decided that she wanted us to go contrary to the Lord, then I can't go. And vice versa, if I tell her that we need to go back to sinning, she's not going with me. Can't take it. And we're not taking anything with us when we leave here. He says in verse 16, and verse 15, love not the world. And by the way, these are God's instructions to the, through the Apostle John. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And, and listen, there's some folk they can't stop working. There's folk they can't stop stop this or, or stop that or, 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 or do this or do that. I can't go to church because I got to deal with this. I can't, I can't read my Bible because I got some other thing to deal with. I, I can't pray because look, how can I pray? I got to go make some money. And, and guys, what we don't realize that here in time that whatever I got, whatever I'm going to have is all due to Christ and I need to be worshiping him in spirit and in truth and following him. Him because what I know is that without him, I'm not going to have nothing. Amen. And look, if he needs to get my attention, as he's had to do on occasion, he knows how to do that as well. Amen. He says, love, not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He says in verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And guys, these three things, and we see that here in 1 John, are the three things that Satan likes to use to tempt even believers to go back to the world and by the way, it's the same three he used to tempt Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, which is where we're going to go right now. Guys, mark your page here and go with me to Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. That's page 2 in your pew Bible, if you're using a pew Bible. I don't think you'll have no problem finding that. Genesis, thank you, Lord. Chapter 3. Mark your page, because we will flip back right back once we're done here. Beginning at verse 1. And some verses we've seen before in different various occasions, and we're going to take a look at them again. Genesis 3, beginning at verse 1. If you're with me, say amen. amen. And he says here, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And the word subtle, it can mean cunning. In other words, he was cunning in regard to how he worked his act. It says, and he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So we see here that this serpent is not just a regular serpent. We knew that, that Satan was kicked out of heaven for his disobedience, for his pride, and was thrown down the earth, and somehow he inhabited this serpent, and then this serpent begins to talk to this woman. He, he initiated the conversation, and, and listen, it was no issue with, with Eve being afraid or Adam being afraid because they didn't even know what fear was. Fear had not even come into the equation. So he's talking to her, and in reality, she shouldn't have been talking to him, but she's talking to her. He says in verse, uh, look at verse 1 again. Now the servant was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And again, he knows some of what God says. The intent, he'll skew it and mess it up and try to change the meaning. And the woman said unto the serpent, in other words, she answered him, should not, but she did, and says, we may eat of the fruit 
of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God says, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And, and listen, she was kind of right, but she misquoted God. He never did say, don't touch it, but it would have been a good idea not to touch it. And, and listen, in regard to them dying, God knew what, died, what death was. She really didn't. Satan knew exactly what it was, and he's taking her down a path because she's at, uh, uh, in the, or, or got in a conversation with him, a conversation that she never should have gotten. And by the way, we don't need to have those kind of conversations about what God said either. What he says, he says, and we need to know what he says so that we won't get tripped up up as well. In verse 4 it says, And the servant said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. And listen, he's cunning, he's slick, he's crafty, and going to say it in a way that might seem plausible. And then he's going to explain to her, and he says in verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And listen, what he's saying there is actually true, but Eve and Adam in their innocency did not realize what this thing was all about. There was a reason why God said, don't eat it. He knew. And all they had to do was be obedient to what he said and not try to figure this thing out and not try to have some slick talking preaching ser uh, serpent come along to talk them out of God's truth. And, and yes, what he said is true but they would become gods to themselves and they would leave the true and the living God's protection and they would begin to fend for themselves. It says in verse six, and when the woman looked, saw that the tree was good for food. And, and by the way, we just saw in first John, that would be lust of the flesh and that it was pleasant to the eyes and that would be lust of the eye. And that the tree is said to be desired to make one wise. And listen, that would be the pointing toward the pride of man. It says, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband uh, uh, with her and he did eat. So we see the big three, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And we see also her husband was in the proximity and somewhere along the line perhaps he should have stepped in but he didn't and he ate as well. Here honey, take a bite of this. It's so good. And he ate. Verse 7 says, And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. The verse says, and listen, before they were walking around naked as jaybirds, but they were covered by God's righteousness. They knew nothing about sin, even uh, 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 the sin of, uh, of being embarrassed about being uh, naked like a, ch a kid. He'll run outside with nothing on him. You know, you know, I know nothing about none of that. And they didn't either. But the moment they disobeyed God, then they opened themselves to the, the parameters of the things of the world, which were sin, hallelujah, and even the lustfulness in regard to their bodies. They opened all that up and did not even realize how rough it was actually going to be. And, and even in our time, guys, a lot of times folks will say, well, it's only a little white lie. Well, it's only lying a little bit on my taxes. Well, you know, they allow that. Well, I'm only going 10 miles over the speed limit. And, and listen, we can stretch that thing all the way out. And, and what he did, he got them. He, 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 he tricked Eve into doing it. And, and I, Adam, with his eyes wide open, went along with the program. And they realized that, man, we have loved the protection of God. And, and listen, they did that. And, and even for us in the new covenant, guys, we will always, if we're believers, have a relationship with him, if indeed we are his. But we can always leave his fellowship when we sin. And look, when we pray now and we're in fellowship, we get answers to those prayers. 
And, and listen, when we need to be blessed, we are blessed of God as he sees fit. But when we sin and break that fellowship, it would be like my son doing something to make me upset. And though I'm always his father, he'll break that fellowship and he will need to get right with me in regard to us to get back to where we were in fellowship. And that's exactly what happened with the sin of Adam and Eve. He says in verse 7, And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together. They cover, covered themselves and made themselves apron. Uh, and again, they were covered by God. Now they're covering themselves. It gets worse. Verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam said, and Adam and his wife, look, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And, and listen, they had never, they had always fellowship with God in, in the cool of the day. They had never hid from him. And for the first time they're doing that. And, and guys, I got to tell you, I, I see even believers today, sometimes they get out of fellowship. They fall back in the old sin. And, and I'm telling you, what I've read and know and what I've done and know, and, and you don't want no parts of nothing from the Lord. You don't want your partner coming and say, hey, how you doing? You, well, why don't you come to church no more? You don't want to hear it and they don't want to face God because even though they before did not know what sin was they know what it is now and they're trying to hide from him because they know that they're not right with him anymore amen look at verse 9 and the Lord God called unto Adam and, and, and said unto him where art thou and he, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And, and again, was never afraid before, never even realized he was naked before, never hid from God before. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree where I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And, and listen, he knew. And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest me, gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. In other words, the blame game started then, and it's still going on. God, uh, uh, God is not me, it's that wife you give me. And I'm trying to do right, but she won't let me do right. And on, and on, and on. Verse 13, and we'll end here, and it says, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. She was honest. He tricked her. But Adam, with his eyes wide open, he did willingly sin. And, and by the way, God gave him the commandment in regard to that trait, and he passed it on to Eve. So his transgression is even that much more worse. But we'll leave it there, and we'll flip back to second to first John chapter two. And we'll reread verse 16. Thank you, Lord. If you're with me, say amen. amen. And the verse says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Verse 17 says, and the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God, he says, abideth forever. And, and listen, what we know is that as believers, we're just passing through here, even though sometimes we pitch our tents like we're never going to leave, but we are only, we're pilgrims, we're just passing through. And, and listen, we're gonna be here for a minute, and then we're gonna be going either by death or by rapture. And in this world, guys, there are only two types of folk. Those that know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and those that don't. No middle ground, like no little bit of pregnant. Either you are or you are not. And listen, for those that are, ought to know that they are and they ought to be trying to grow in grace and those who are not, they should be hearing from those who know so that they too 
can get an understanding of this great God that we serve. He says in verse 18, he begins to speak about those that will seduce you, even believers. We know Satan tried to tempt Christ. He don't care nothing about us either. He says in verse 18, little children, it is the last time. And as you had heard, he said, the Antichrist shall come. John says, even now are there, look, many Antichrists, whereby we know that is the last time. And listen, he's talking about legions of folk during his time that were vehemently against the Lord. And listen, even now there are even that much more. And I love the fact that even in scripture, in the gospel, he talks about the wide gate for those that don't know God and the narrow gate for those that do. And listen, what we know, he says that few there are that go through, there are going to be abundance of folk that are going to go to hell. And there are going to be a few in regard to all the people that have been born from, from day one all the way up to now that have come to faith. In Jesus Christ, in verse in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, I'm not going there, I'm just going to read it. It says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, and, and listen, or vice versa, you cannot serve God and mammon. And, and guys, either we're going to serve Christ and serve him with everything we got, or we are not. There's no part-time Christians. And we're either in this thing for good or we're not. And we need to make up our minds in our hearts just with side of the coin we fall on. He says in verse 18, little children, it is the last time and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are many Antichrists whereby we know we are in the last time. In verse 19 he said, they went out from us but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. And I love this verse. He says, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. And guys, personally, I know a lot of folk that started off with me, even some that were training with me in ministry and, and, and even as a deacon that were training. And man, we are all on fire for the Lord. And as time went on, man, and, and, and we begin to grow in grace, or at least we thought we were, and, and then some of these guys that I don't see anymore, and I call them, and they tell me, well, I kind of fell away, or I'm finished the Jesus thing, or I accomplished everything I was supposed to. Guys, this is a lifelong pursuit that starts with our be a belief on Jesus Christ, and it never ends. And there are times when we fall back. Yes, sometimes we slip, but we get right back on that horse if we belong to the Lord, and he's not going to let us stay in that place. Amen. And for those that have gone and have gone back into the world, there's an issue with the belief that they say they have. Because I only know the Christ in my heart, and I know I could not abandon him. Not to mention I wouldn't have any place else to go. Amen. Amen. If you would mark this page and go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. That'll be on page 924 if you're using a pew Bible. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Gospel of John, chapter 6. Now, I got it here somewhere. And verse 41, page 924, I believe that would be. Thank you, Lord. Gospel of John, chapter 6, beginning at verse 41. Looks like we're all there. Say amen, please. Amen. And it writes here, and, and um, John writes here, he says, the, the Jews that murmured at him because he said, I am the, the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saved, I came down from heaven? And, and listen, they think they know him, but in reality, they really don't. And Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not among yourselves. In, in other words, I know what you're talking about. No man can come to me, it says, except the father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. 
And listen, he's saying, now you'll be mine, and you'll be mine when I come back for you. In other words, you don't know me because you have not been called by my father to know me. He says in verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that have heard and have learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man, he says, have seen the Father, say he which which uh, which is of God have seen the Father. And of course, Christ is speaking about himself. He's speaking about a ton of unbelievers, some Pharisees, some Sadducees. And these guys think that they're the ones, but in reality, they're not the ones. Verse 47 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am, he says, the bread of life. And listen, when they would hear the designation of I am, that's always pointing to God. And what Christ is saying is that I'm God. I'm God the Son. He says, your fathers, verse 49, did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is a bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am, here we go again, the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give, he says, for the life of the world. And listen, Christ is getting deep here. And of course, he's losing, already lost most of them. He probably lost the other half right here. In verse 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves Say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And, and listen, of course the carnal mind can never understand what he's saying here. It would take God's spirit to help them to understand. Verse 53 says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood have eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. And listen, they can't get what he's saying, but he's talking about consuming Christ wholeheartedly. His finished works from the moment that he was born to a virgin all the way up until God took him out into the heaven. That you're consuming that and believing that. He's not talking about a fleshly eating, but he's talking about a spiritual eating. And God's people would know what he's talking about. It says, for my flesh is meat indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. And he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me and I live, he said, by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. And listen, he's talking about by faith consuming the true and living God. Verse 58 says, this is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things, it says, said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, and, 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 and Matthew's using, um, John's using that term loosely, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it. And listen, the only one that could hear it would be those that had been prepared by God himself. Verse 61 says, that, And when Jesus knew in himself that the disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? And what? And if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, and of course he's talking about heaven, it is the spirit that quickeneth. In other words, you're trying to get this and understand this with a carnal mind, but you need a spiritual mind because the carnal, I mean, because the spirit is the one that gives you understanding. He is the helper and he is the one that makes one alive. It says the spirit profited nothing. He said the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And listen, what he's saying is that they come from God's Holy Spirit and they give life to those that receive it. In verse 64, he says, but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning 
who they were that believed not, of course he did, and who should betray him. And he said, therefore, said I unto you, that no man could come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. And listen, the father draws folk to his son. He goes on, verse 66. From that time, look, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And listen, they were disciples in word, but they were not disciples in deed. And what we see here, man, the going got, the spiritual going got tough. And those that really did not know Jesus, they got going. And listen, what we know is that we can't do his work. We can't understand his truth. We can't even reckon to know Jesus Christ unless the Spirit touches our heart. And by faith, we know who he is and know what he's done for us. In verse 67, it said, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, these are his handpicked guys, will ye also go away? And that's a good question. And then Simon Peter answered, answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And, and this is key, verse 69. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and listen, he's saying that, look, we don't know everything. And we've seen the miracles. We, we, we see, heard your words. And, and, and listen, the spirits touch our heart in regard to the truthfulness of it. And guys, even for us on this side of Christ, and he's in heaven and has sent his spirit, I don't know a whole lot about a whole lot of things. But what I do know is that Jesus Christ, the son of God, in fact, the only begotten son of God, he came to earth, he put on flesh, he got on a cross, he died and was buried and was raised the third day and I don't know about nobody else but I know he died for me. I know that. And in my heart I know that. So much so I'm willing to die for that fact. Because he died for me. And just like the twelve Peter and the rest of the guys say one. They had no place else for them to go. And guys, I wouldn't know where to go if I left Christ. And, and there had been a time or two when I tried to go back in the world and I realized I was not suited for worldly living anymore. And because of what Christ has started in my heart through his Holy Spirit, that this is not my home and the works of this world are not my home and that I now belong to him in my home, the reason why I feel so strange sometimes on earth is because this is not my home. My home is with him in heaven. He says in verse 69, and we believe in our shore that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, answered them, have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil. And he speak or spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. And even in Christ's midst, even one guy that he laid hands on, one guy that heard his teaching, heard his preaching, saw the things and the miraculous that he did, but his heart was dark and his heart was, 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 was stiff and hard, and he never received the calling of God to be one of his disciples. And even in the midst of his hand-picked guys, he could not ever come to the place of belief. Amen? Back, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2. Look at verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. In other words, they left, and when they left, we could see, we could tell by the fruit that they never truly belonged 
to the Lord. Look at verse 20 of chapter 2. If you're with me, say amen. amen. He goes on and he talks about uh, to, that, that for the believers, we're to live in Christ at all times. He says in verse 20, but ye have an unction. And he's talking about true believers from the Holy One. And ye know all things. In other words, he's talking about God's spirit that anoints the believer not only to live for Christ, but to work out of his power and not have to try to work out of your own. And this unction that he has given us, and though we don't know all things, but listen, we know right from wrong. And as we grow in grace and become a young man or a mature father in Christ, we know even that much more. He says, I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. And listen, what we know is that as a believer, you can either serve God, I mean that you're going to serve God, and when it comes to serving the things of the world, that will never do. Not for the true believer. In fact, you can't survive without Christ. And by the way, again, I read it in scripture and I know it's true, but I've actually tried it, tried to go back. And without him, man, I could not do nothing except fail. And it will be the same for you as well. In verse 22, he says, who is a liar? But he that denied that Christ or Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist that denieth the father and the son. And we already saw John pointed out there are many of them out there during his time and there are many of them out there during our time. And guys, these guys were working out of the spirit of the world, they're working out of the spirit of Satan, they're working as the antichrist in our time. Some of them might look good, they might smell good, they might even be nice folk. And look, you might even be halfway friends with one, thinking that they were right, but sooner or later, they're going to show themselves for who they are, and they will show themselves to be vehemently against the things of Christ when the rubber meets the road and you're standing firm on your belief of Jesus Christ, they're going to come against you because they know not the God of this Bible and surely don't know his son. He says in verse 22, who is the liar? But he that denied that Christ, he is antichrist, that denied the father and the son. Whosoever denied the son the same have not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. And again, you can't have one without the other. And there are those that they want to worship Father God and they will talk about Father God. Not a bad thing. But when you get narrow and you introduce the Son, because you can't get to Father God without going through the Son. They will get the hairs on their back raised up because in reality, they really don't know our Lord and Savior because you can't get the Father without first going through the Son. Guys, I'm going to close there. This sermon series is called Obedience is Better Than Sacrifice. In other words, God would have us to do what he wants us to do there are some folk that they don't send their money to church. I know some husbands don't go and their wives will go and they'll give them the money. And I actually had a guy tell me one time, he said, I said, man, how come you don't, your wife comes to church and you don't, I'm not talking about here, I'm talking about somewhere else, and, 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 and you don't come. And he said, well, I send my money there. Now, now that's your sacrifice. And God wants your obedience. And for the believer, we ought to do what he tells us to do. And I don't care if you give a million dollars to the church. If you're not being obedient to what God says do, then you are none of his. And that's what John is helping us understand. That if we're his, we'll have a desire and an unction and a power from God to do right in every situation that we find ourselves in. Will we mess up sometimes? Oh yeah, we will. Will we slip up sometimes? Oh yes, we will. But it won't be an ongoing area of falling back into sin. And if you can live there freely without it bothering you, there's a problem with this salvation that you say you have. Because if you can sin freely, 
then I dare say that Christ does not belong to you. Or better said, you don't belong to Christ. Amen? Amen. Let us bow, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this ministry moment, for this time in which we can look into your, your book of truth, Father God, and allow you by your spirit to touch and bless and minister to us in a mighty and a special way. Father God, I read the words, I interpret the words, I give you what you have given, give them what you have given me. But Father, your spirit has the ability to place these truths in our heart in, in a place, in, in a particular way to speak to us some words that we needed to hear. And I pray you've done that today. Father God, we are still praying. We're praying for Deborah Swartley. Her husband's away, but she's sickly. She's going through some things, Father God. Minister to her, bless her in a mighty and a special way. We're praying, Father God, for Stanley Pawinski in regard to where he's at in the hospital. And Lord, he needs you. Oh, Lord, he needs you more than he ever has. We pray for him, for his physical health. We pray for his spiritual health. And we pray for his wife as well, Father God, that you'll bless and minister and give them what they also need in time so that they will spend in eternity with you in glory when that time comes. Father God, we thank you. We praise you. We say yes to your will and to your way. Father God, each and every one within the sound of our voice are going through some things. And I pray that through your spirit, you'll touch them and speak to them and minister to them. Father God, let us all know that somehow, as your children, everything is going to be okay. We thank you. We praise you. We say yes to your will. As God's church says, amen. And amen. God bless you guys and thank you. Thank you.